all my sins are forgiven. Amen. I've been one. That's right. That's right. You're right. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yes, yes. Amen. It's not in my Genesis, it's not in my baptism, it's not in my church membership. It's only in the You're right. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. Yes. Yes, he did. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yes, thank you, Lord. Revelation 22, 13. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and the end. Amen. Matthew 5, 17. I think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not to come to destroy, but to fulfill. Luke chapter 18, verse 27. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Amen. Have your Bible this morning. You can find our text in the book of John. Book of John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Once you find your place in the book of John, chapter number 8, if you're willing and able to stand for the reading of God's Word, I want to share with you a few verses this morning, beginning in verse number 31. John, chapter number 8, verse number 31. Verse 31, the Word of God says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yeah. Notice verse 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Verse 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning that we can come in your presence. And Lord, we can call you Father. And Lord, I realize today it's not anything of our doings. But Lord, it's all the cause where sin abound, grace doth much more abound. And Lord, you looked down through the portals of time and knew that man that you would create would sin and fall. But Lord, before the first sin was ever committed, Lord, I'm thankful that you had a plan of redemption already in place. And Lord, I'm thankful today that you're willing Lord, to look beyond our sin and our faults and failures. And Lord, uh, through the eyes of your mercy and grace and compassion, Lord, that you, uh, Lord, had a place of love in your heart towards us, the undeserving. And uh, Lord, that you didn't just declare that love, but you demonstrated it on Calvary. And Lord, I'm thankful today, uh, Lord, that I have a personal relationship with you. Lord, I understand about that joy that's unspeakable and full of glory and that peace that passeth all understanding. Lord, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as personal Savior, Lord, there might be somebody here today that's been faithful, uh, Lord, to go through the religious works and motions, but Lord, never understood the difference between religion and relationship. Lord, I pray this will be the day that you'd speak to that heart and open those blinded eyes and birth them into your family. Uh, Lord, I'm thankful today that you are our hope. Lord, you're all our hope, and Lord, I praise you. Lord, I pray in these next few moments that you'd give us special special liberty from heaven. Uh, Lord, we want to be able to rightly divide your word and, uh, Lord, to be able to receive it into our hearts. Lord, you know what we stand in need of today, and I pray that you'd challenge us. Pray, dear Lord, that you would convict us of our sin. Pray that you'd help us to come to a place of repentance, Lord, that we might have that a fellowship with you that you desire to have with us. And, Lord, we praise you, Lord, for all that you've already done and for what you'll do. We thank you in advance for it's in Jesus. 
Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. <clears throat> now, we understand that uh, uh, this is Memorial Weekend, and, and we're going to be uh, recognizing Memorial Day tomorrow. And uh, there seems to be a lot of misunderstanding as to the importance of Memorial, Memorial Day, that there's some that if you would ask them what it um, represents or what it commemorates, that some would only talk about uh, uh, for them a day off from work and to be able to go and have picnic and, and family gatherings and this and that. And, and I'm thankful for those activities. But uh, we understand today there's a whole lot more behind the, uh, the importance uh, of the day than just being able to get a day off from work, that there was a price that was paid and there was a blood that was shed. I heard something yesterday. I had the radio on just for a few moments as I went down to the store and somebody came on and, and they were talking about the difference between Armed Forces Day and Veterans Day and Memorial Day. And I kind of like how they clarified it. Uh, they said that Armed Forces Day is to honor and recognize those that are serving in their uniforms. Uh, they said Veterans Day is to recognize and to honor those that have hung up their uniforms. They said, but Memorial Day is to commemorate and honor and recognize those that died in their uniforms. Died in their uniforms. Now, if you drove in this morning and looked out in front of our flags, you'll notice that there was a bunch of small flags. There's around 100 out there, and they're placed, and they're uh, in a, a remembrance uh, of those that have uh, uh, died serving our country throughout the years. And and uh, I saw those flags and was thinking about that uh, they're just small in comparison to as to how many lives that were shed on the battlefield. Uh, whenever I saw the, we put those flags out yesterday and this morning we came in and it made me think about a, a church uh, years ago and the pastor had taken and done something similar and uh, he had gotten some little flags and placed them all over the building and in the foyer. And uh, there was one of the little young men that came out of Sunday school and he came up to the a sanctuary and he saw all those little flags and he asked the pastor he said what does those flags mean and he said well son those flags represent those that are no longer with us those that died in service a little boy swallowed real hard and looked, looked worried and he said which service was it was it the morning or the evening <laughs> but we understand today that there's those that died in their service those that died in their service to serving this country and this nation. There's those that's died in service serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as martyrs. Uh, there's been some question as to how Memorial Day and recognition ever began. And there's a couple of different opinions and ideas that goes back. One of them is going back to April of 1863. And it was in Columbus, Mississippi and said there was a little elderly woman there that uh, she went to the cemetery and she took some uh, flowers and she was going to decorate the graves of two of her sons that had uh, died in the Civil War. And after she had placed them on their graves that she walked over to the back side of the cemetery across the hill uh, down in the bottom corner. And there was two mounds of dirt down there with no kind of grave markers or anything on it. And she began to decorate those graves as well. Uh, somebody that observed for a distance came up and they said, ma'am, said, uh, don't you know that uh, those uh, uh, graves that you're decorating are those of the uh, Union soldiers? Uh, and uh, she said, I understand that. And she said, I know that uh, my son were my sons were Confederate. She said, but I understand that somewhere up north that there perhaps is a mother uh, or a wife uh, uh, or family that's grieving over the loss of theirs just like we are ours. Can I tell you that? Every life today has value, and every person today is important. And regardless of whether you live in the north or whether you live in the south or whether you live in this side of the world or this side of the world, that every single individual has value to God. And he laid down his life and shed his blood, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a place of repentance. And Lord, help us if we ever come to a place to where we fail to have compassion in our heart, and not just towards those that we care about, but we ought to have compassion even for our enemies and pray that God would deliver them and God would save them. Yeah. Whenever we think about the other side of this, it said that placing flowers on the graves is something that started in May the 5th, 1866 in Waterloo, New York, and later on became a common practice in uh, May of 30th, uh, 1868, and, and uh, we don't know, maybe those things work together, 
But we do know today that there was many that was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. And we uh, want to remember and honor that, uh, that sacrifice that was made. Now what really bothers me and upsets me is in a land where we have so much freedom and so much liberty. Uh, there so, seems to be uh, so many that are ungrateful for the liberties that we have. I'm going to tell you, they may not seem to have value to some today, but you let those liberties be taken away, and you'll realize just how blessed we've been. And it didn't come without a price. It didn't come without a payment being made. Uh, I have that patriotic heart, and I'm dis. I'm disappointed with some of the things I see happening in our nation, and I'm upset today over a sin that's being paraded around and being praised and applauded when I know it goes against God's word and against God's will. It upsets me to see things going downhill spiritually and all the apostasy that's happening. But even in midst of all the wickedness that's going on, I can still say, thank God I'm still proud and thankful to God that I'm an American. I've been to some of these other places, and, and we're no better than nobody, but I'll tell you this, we're better off than a whole lot of people. Uh, there's many that would give anything to have the freedoms and the liberties that we've been given today. And to see somebody get on national television and to uh, degrade the flag and burn it in by public view, and, and those that have no regard for the price that was paid, and, and the people who paid the price, uh, I tell you, it breaks my heart. And I think, how in the world could you be so blinded? And how in the world could you be so, uh, so, uh, so uh, ups? And I, I, sa I said this many times. Some of those folks that don't have a love for our country, if they would have taken, taken them somewhere else for a few months and bring them back, I think they would have a different opinion. I've always wondered this, if you have such a hatred for the place that you live and the people that you live around, why don't you just move? Amen? Why make it miserable for everybody else? Now, that's not the message this morning. I gave that to you for free. Amen. That's just my opinion. That's not to thus saith the Lord. That's my opinion. But uh, I came across something here a while back, and I was looking it over, and I don't know how reliable it is that I run so I did some studies myself. But I had wondered throughout the years what kind of number of people that died in, uh, in war uh, serving this country. And I looked at different, different websites and Google searches, and, and I came up with all different type of numbers. So I'm sure this morning that my numbers may be either high or they may be low. But just to give you a little bit of idea, that said during the Revolutionary War, approximately 33,000 died. During the War of 1812, 7,000. The Mexican War, 13,000. The Civil War, somewhere around 900,000. Spanish-American, 4,000. Uh, the uh, First World War was about 320,000. The second being somewhere near, uh, near a million. The Korean War, 157,000. Uh, the Vietnam was around 111,000 or so. The Gulf War, uh, 700,000 plus, whatever is up to date, things that have happened. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying uh, somewhere uh, near 2 million or more that have died. And for us to ever uh, look over that and, and it not have an impact upon us uh, means that we don't understand the importance of the price that they paid. Now, we understand Memorial Day commemorates those that was willing to provide, preserve, and to protect our uh, freedoms and our liberties. Uh, this kind of sacrifice uh, involves uh, self-denial, those that was determined uh, even in the face of danger, those that was term determined uh, uh, even in spite of fear, those that were determined and resolved in their heart to go all the way even if it meant death. Knowing that when they said goodbye to their families, they may not see them again on this side. I came across a poem that I've shared here before. And I don't know who the author is, I'd give credit, but the poem says this, I watched the flag pass by one day, it fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. With hair cut square and eyes alert, he'd stand out in any crowd. I thought how many men like him had fallen through the years? How many died on foreign soil? How many mother's tears? How many pilots' planes shot down above the deep blue sea? How many foxholes were soldiers' graves? No freedom isn't free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. 
I wondered just how many times that taps had meant amen when a flag had draped a coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of all the children of the mothers and the wives of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about the graveyard at the bottom of the sea, of unmarked graves at Arlington. No freedom isn't free. That's what I want to preach on this morning, taking these verses out of John chapter number 8. I want to preach on this thought, freedom isn't free. Uh, we know that on one occasion that in John chapter number 15 and verse number 13, uh, that the word of God said this, Greater love hath no man than this, uh, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Now, you know, there is a certain element in, in most individuals that there's people that you love and care about to the point to where you may be willing to make that kind of sacrifice. Uh, I think as a, a dad that, uh, that in my heart, that if it came down to one of my children or myself, that I'd be willing to lay my life down. If it came to my spouse, I'd be willing to lay my life down. And for those that have served this country, that we made a, a commitment in our heart, if need be, we'd lay our life down for those that, uh, that we might have freedom and liberties and generations on. And uh, we go on and we think about there is people that uh, you may be willing to die for and willing to lay down your life for. But I wonder today, if you turn this thing around, uh, what about those that would be willing to die for their enemies? Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. But I tell you, there is a love that's greater than that. And the only time we've ever seen it displayed is when Jesus went to Calvary, and Jesus didn't die for the deserving. He didn't die for the godly. He didn't die for the worthy. He didn't die for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies, those that were against him. By the way, it's what all of us were before salvation. You say, not me, preacher, I'll always be a no, not according to the word of God. Uh, when you go to the book of Romans, uh, chapter number 5, listen to these verses. Romans chapter 5, verse number 6, the word of God says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I say praise the Lord. I thank God for the atonement that's been received. But when you look at these verses, verse number six says we were without strength. You know what that means? It means we was helpless and hopeless. We was in a situation that needed to be changed. We was in a situation in which we needed deliverance. We was in a situation to where we needed victory, but we were without strength to do anything to make any type of difference. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying we couldn't redeem ourselves. Right. Uh, we couldn't cancel out one sin. Uh, there's not enough rights you can do to cancel out one wrong. There's a, a false mentality today, and people think, well, when I get to uh, heaven, that uh, it's going to see if my good outweighs my bad, and whichever way this thing teeters, that's the way I'm going. I'm going to tell you this, you don't have any good to outweigh your bad, that for all of sin to come short of the glory of God, there's none good, no, not one. We were without strength. The Word of God says ungodly. You know, in our mind, when we think of ungodly, we think of those that are in direct rebellion towards God and, and all kind of wicked and perversion and, and maybe even in satanic stuff. But you know today that you could look like a model church member and still be ungodly? What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying you can have your name on the roll of the church. You can sing in the choir. Whenever time they uh, come up to the choir loft, you can give your tithes and offerings. You can uh, support missions. Uh, uh, you can pray. Uh, you can even share the gospel. But yet, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you're classified by the Word of God as being ungodly. You know why? Because ungodly means to be without God 
and it means to be without Christ. And I tell you this, I was an ungodly uh, church member. Uh, I grew up in church, was always there, but one Sunday morning, thank the Lord, uh, him not being willing that any should perish, dealt with my heart and saved me. And thank God I was birthed into his family. Now, I might not look like much today, but I tell you this, thank God I'm not without him, that he lives within me. And he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, and lo, I'll be thee always, even until the end of the world. I'm glad today, praise God, I've been birthed into his family. Amen. The word of God says we were sinners in verse number eight. The word sinner here comes from the Greek word, which means to miss the mark. Uh, that's our Bible school theme this year. Uh, we've got some archery set up and we've got some uh, targets set up. And the idea is this. It don't matter how good you are, that we're all going to miss the mark. Why? Because the mark is not religion. The mark is not turning over a new leaf. The mark is not about quitting this and starting that. The mark is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. A life that's without sin. A life that's perfect. And none of us ever could live that kind of life. Uh, that's why Jesus came and died for us and shed his blood and made atonement. And thank God we've been reconciled. He took sinful man by the one hand and he took holy righteous father by the other. And he reconciled us and brought us together in him through his death on Calvary's cross. I tell you this morning, I'm thankful thankful today that I've been reconciled with him, but we were sinners by nature that every single one of us had come short of the glory of God. Did you know that there'll never, ever, ever be anybody in heaven because of their own goodness and righteousness? You and I know that, but yet you witness and people say, well, I've been a good person. Well, the Bible says there's none good. There's none righteous. For our very best as, uh, as filthy rags in the uh, sight of God. Uh, that for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But then we look on down in verse number 10, and the word of God says, For if when we were enemies, uh, the word enemy here, you know what that is? The one that is opposed. That we were opposed to God. We were uh, we had a master, but our master was a, a Satan himself. When you think about uh, over in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 2, where the apostle Paul shows us a picture of the before and after salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. By the way, did you know a dead person cannot do anything to revive themselves? Not one thing. When Lazarus had died and they put him there uh, in the tomb and they put that stone uh, and uh, Mary and Martha was upset and Jesus came and he said, where have you laid him? And they said, uh, come and see. And he told them to take away the stone and they said, oh, Lord, he stinketh by now. But nevertheless, that they did that and they, uh, you know what? I thought about this. Lazarus couldn't do one thing to change his situation. His sisters loved him, no doubt loved him as much as you can love somebody, but they couldn't change the situation. But Jesus came on the a scene and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, uh, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Believeth thou this? Uh, we know, Lord, but he said, no. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. I tell you this, not only was he resurrected and, and has life, but thank God because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he said, I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said, preacher, how long is this thing going to last? Forever and ever and ever. You know what saved means? Saved means to be rescued from all harm and danger. If I was still in danger and still in harm, then I wouldn't be saved. But thank God I've been saved to the uttermost. And I know that I am. My blood's been washed in the precious blood of the spotless lamb. I'm thankful today that I've been given eternal life. And the Lord Jesus said, and you shall never perish. Matter of fact, I'm not going to die. I'm going to lay this old body down one day. But thank God to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. Don't ever say, well, a pastor, he's no longer with us. He died. No. The apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. But I, I think about, you know what's so sad today is uh, there's many that lives in the land of the free and understand the freedoms that we have as Americans, but yet never have experienced true freedom and liberty in their own lives. Amen. Did you know it's possible today that somebody could live in the land of the free and still be in bondage? Yeah. 
As a matter of fact, I, I thought about it. I'm glad, thank the Lord, we can assemble today. I thank God that we can come and, and preach and pray and worship and testify and witness. And, and we can do that not only in here, but we can do it out in this world. But yet, even though we have those kind of freedoms and liberties, there's a whole lot of people today that may be free socially, but they are bound spiritually. Do you know that's what these verses are dealing with this morning that I read earlier? Let's go back to John chapter number 8 and look a little bit further in the text. Verse number 33, we find uh, that uh, Jesus spoke to a group of Jews, and he talked to them about freedom. He talked about the truth that would make them free. Now, here's the problem with these Jews that he dealt with, is they didn't think they needed any type of freedom. They didn't think they needed any type of savior. They didn't think they needed a deliverer. Why? Because they thought they were already free. You know what they said? They said, verse number 33, they answered him, we be, uh, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? Now, the Lord Jesus answered them, and we find in verse number 34, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Jesus is talking about some spiritual things here. And he said, if you've ever committed a sin, that you're not free. You're a sinner, and not only are you a sinner, but you're a servant to sin. Uh, you're a slave to sin. Uh, you're a slave to self. Uh, you're a slave to Satan. And he says, it don't matter if you're of Abraham or not, that ye must be born again. You need a deliverer, you need a savior, you need a redeemer. Jesus begins to make it clear in verse number 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now when we look at this passage of scripture, there's a few thoughts right quick. And first of all, we think about the source of our freedom. Verse number 32, that Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth and the truth. Now, first of all, we've got to determine what is this truth that Jesus is talking about. Well, we know today that the only absolute truth that we have is God's Word. Anything man has a part of it is unreliable. But God's Word is inerrant. It's infallible. It's inspired. It is absolute truth that it's trustworthy, it's forever settled in heaven. Uh, God doesn't ever have to go back and rewrite what's been wrote. Uh, he don't ever have to change. Uh, he don't ever have to uh, make exceptions because of the generation that we're living in. I'm going to tell you this, when God spoke his word, it's been consistent, and thank God it's consistent. Uh, one man told me one day, he said, I like what you got to say about all this stuff. He said, but the problem is all you've got to base it upon is that book. I say, thank God that's all I need to base it upon because it is trustworthy. And it's reliable and it is forever settled in heaven. But truth goes beyond this book. Because this truth speaks about the one who gave us this book. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. He said, I am the way, the only way. A man told me one day, he said, you Baptists are so narrow-minded and legalistic and all this stuff. I said, why do you say that? He said, because y'all believe that, uh, that uh, uh, you, uh, there's only one way to heaven. Y'all believe that Jesus is the only way. I said, no. I said, we don't believe that because we're Baptists. We believe that because we're Bible believers, because that's what thus saith the Lord. It's not something that our denomination come up with. It's about what God said. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And when you stand before God and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? I can say, thank God, because Jesus died for my sin. That one day you dealt with my heart and I come to you by faith. And you saved me by grace. But the problem today is the world doesn't know what truth is. <clears throat> there's so much deception. There's so much going on. I believe today we need to know the truth about sin. Wouldn't you agree? You know, my heart goes out to multitudes of people that will never hear anything from the pulpit about sin. 
They asked one preacher, they said, why don't you ever talk about sin? Why don't you ever preach about sin? He said, well, people feel bad enough throughout the week, and when they come to church, they come to be made feel good, and they need to be uh, reaffirmed, and they need to be uh, to lifted up, and they need to find the best in themselves and all that stuff. I tell you this, I wouldn't give you two cents for somebody that didn't tell me the truth about God's Word. And he said, preach the counsel, the whole counsel, and we have to start out with the fact that we're all sinners in need of salvation. The songwriter said, I'm glad I got lost. So I could be found. I wouldn't ever thought I needed a savior or deliverer either if I hadn't have known how bad a shape I was in. God shows us. That's why the law was given. The law was never given as a means of salvation. There's nobody that could keep the law other than Jesus himself. But the law was given to show man that no matter how much we tried and how hard we tried, that we could never live up to God's holy righteous standards. We're always going to come short. And the law was given so that whenever Jesus Christ would come, that man would run straight to his feet and say, Oh God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Oh Lord, forgive me of my sin and come into my heart. I thank God today there's a remedy. We need to know the truth about the Savior. Amen. I'm glad I know, thank God, he died for my sin. Yeah. Understand the truth about sacrifice. Now, you know what these Jews said? They said, we be Abraham's seed and we were never in bondage to any man. That's one of the most foolish statements sure, yeah. that they could have ever made. Sure. Amen. You know why? Because look back over the Jewish history up to that point. And they had been in bondage and captivity uh, to at least seven different major uh, strong nations. And as a matter of fact, when they made this statement, they was under the heel and the authority of Rome themselves. And so they wasn't even free politically like they thought they were. And they certainly wasn't free spiritually. Amen. But what they were saying is we don't need a savior. We don't need a deliverer. We don't need a redeemer. Why don't you need it? Because we're all right. And Jesus said, no, you're not really all right as you think you are. This world needs to know that we're not all right without Jesus. Right. Amen. Amen. Truth convicts, but truth lays out. I'm glad the Lord didn't just give us the bad side. Yeah. For the wages of sin is death. We're sinners. Man. But, yeah. but. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm glad, thank God, there's a, a good side to it. But what's, what's so sad today is you've got people listening to every voice except for the only voice that matters. When I go back here and I look in the text, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, my word. And when you look up here in verse number 37, uh, he said, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word hath no place in you. Yeah. There's all these different words going on from different sources. And people say, well, I just don't know what to believe. You know what's going to happen here soon? People are going to say, I don't know who to vote for because this politician saying this and this politician saying that, and I don't know which one's telling the truth, and I don't know which one's telling, I don't know. And I had somebody tell me here a while back, said, I don't know what to believe spiritually. I said, why not? They said, because I went down to this kind of uh, religious place, and they told me this. And then I went over to this religious place, and they told me this. And all of them tell me different things. And I said, listen. I said, what you need to do is quit listening to that crowd and quit listening to that, that crowd and start listening to the creator of the universe, uh, the one who is the final authority, the one who thus saith the Lord. That's who you need to start listening to. And I said, that's what will make a difference. Somebody said here a while back, we've heard from the nation's capital. We've heard from New York. We've heard from Hollywood. We've heard from all the religious circles. We've heard from all the political parties. We've heard from the abortionists and the gay uh, right activists. We've heard from all these. But don't you think it's time that as a nation we need to hear from God? We need to hear from God. And not only hear from God, but to heed his word. By the, by the way, he said, you shall... Know the truth, and the truth yes. shall make you free. Yeah. Did you know when he said no, he wasn't talking about an intellectual head knowledge? Right, right. He said, You're gonna, you need to know the truth yeah. in your heart. Right. There's a difference today between knowing about Jesus yeah. Yeah. and knowing Jesus. 
Some say, well, I've always been a believer. Well, so has the devil and the demons. But there's a difference between knowing about him and knowing him as your personal savior. I don't just know about the truth. Thank God I say I know the truth. And it is the truth that has made me free. And that truth is Jesus Christ and his payment for my sin at Calvary. You know what the world calls freedom that the Lord calls bondage? And what the world calls bondage, the Lord, or the, uh, the, the Lord calls freedom. We need truth. And I'm not trying to pick on one particular sin, but I just want to tell you something that happened the, just the other day. I got on my phone one of those Google calendars. Some of you got that. It came with it. And I use it now. I didn't used to know how to use it, but I use it. And I start going in there and putting in dates and all that stuff. And I was looking at the month of June. And I said, my goodness, the month of June is slam packed full. So many things going on, which is good. But I started and I said, I have to be careful before I make any other kind of commitments because I've got dates, overlapping dates and all this stuff. And I started looking and I noticed that on June the 1st, there was a date marked. And I thought, now, wait a minute, that's strange. I don't remember marking anything on my calendar for June the 1st. So I clicked on it. And I wished I hadn't. Because it made me sick to my stomach. You know why? Because it was reminding me that June the 1st was the beginning of of our gay pride month. As I said, I'm not picking on anyone's sin, but I'm going to use this one as an example. Do you know over the years, there have been rallies over this issue. They've marched the streets and flooded, and, and really the message is simple, is we want our freedoms like everybody else. We want our liberties like everybody else. We want to be able to get married like everybody else. We want the world to acknowledge our marriage like everybody else. We want this. We want that. Really what they're saying is we want our freedoms and liberties because we live in the land of the free and the liberty. But Jesus said you can get all that, but you're going to be in greater bondage than you have ever been. You think this brings about liberty, but it don't. It brings about bondage. And by the way, he didn't say that about that particular sin. Uh, when you read on down, he said, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. That every single sin, every type of sin, no matter how, whether you think it's big or small, no matter what it is, that all sin brings about bondage that we need to be liberated from. There's a source of our freedom. That's Jesus himself. There's a scope of our freedom. Verse number 36, he said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I like that. He didn't just say free. He said, but free indeed. You know what that means? It means, thank God, no more bondage. Servants of sin means prisoners, those that are in bondage. You know, one time, at one time, that's what I was. And at one time, that's what you were. And if you're not saved today, that's what you are. But thank God today, there's a, a, a plan of God of redemption that you can turn to him, repent of that sin. And if you confess that sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin and cleanse you of all. But we say, preacher, what have we been delivered from? First of all, I can say, thank God I've been delivered from the wrath to come. You say, where do you get that at? Well, over in the book of Romans, I read it earlier, uh, but I'll read it again right quick in Romans chapter number five. And we look down and the word of God says much more than being now justified. The word justified means justified never sin. How was I justified? It says being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Uh, the book of Ephesians talked about that we were by nature children of wrath even as others. But I say thank God that I've been delivered from the wrath of God that is to come. Uh, I say thank God I've been delivered from condemnation. A woman went to a preacher one day after service and she said, I don't appreciate your message. She said, uh, you was condemning me. He said, ma'am, said, I don't have the means to condemn anybody. He said, but if you're condemned by what I preach, it wasn't me condemning you. It's God. And he said, the Lord tells us that without Jesus Christ that you're condemned already. He said, but I've got good news for you. He says, you can trust him as your Lord and Savior and you can be delivered from that condemnation. When I read over in Romans chapter number eight this morning, the word of God says, there is therefore now... No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. I thank God I've been delivered from death and hell. Amen. 
Uh, when I read over in John chapter number 5 and in verse number 24 that Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And you, and ye hath he quickened who was dead and trespassed. Thank God I passed from death to life. I said the other day, I've got one birthday I can't remember, and thank God I've got one I'll never forget. We've been delivered from the power of sin, are being delivered in Romans chapter 6, and the power of Satan and, and First Peter. Uh, but listen to this, I'm going to close with this. There's a source of freedom, that's Jesus who is the truth. Uh, there is the scope of our freedom, we shall be free indeed. But there's the sacrifice of our freedom. Did you know today that no freedom came without a price? Nothing's free. Everything costs somebody something. When you think about today the liberty that we have as Americans, somebody paid that price. When you think about the liberty that we have as Christians, you can go back and look at the millions that were martyred, that took the and uh, the blood-stained banner and marched out into the face of, of opposition and said, uh, the Lord giveth the Lord, take it, blessed be the name of the Lord, that he's never denied me and I'm not going to deny him. And we read about Fox Book of Martyrs and all that. There's those that paid the price. But you know that all that freedom was bloodly and costly, but it pales in comparison to our spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom is really what matters. Because those today that have any other kind of bondage that one day are going to be delivered from that bondage. But I'll tell you this, thank God for the spiritual freedom. Amen. The spiritual freedom that we have today came with a high price day. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. You know what's sad today is many are like these Jews that Jesus talked to. They said, oh, we're of our father Abraham. We've never been in bondage to any man. We've always been good. We, we're doing just fine. We don't need, if we ever need you, we'll call you, we'll let you know. But as of right now, we're okay. And Jesus said, you're not okay. He said, because you're a servant and a slave to sin. And he said, you seek to kill me. He said, why? Because my words are not in you. I'm going to tell you today, if you don't know what salvation is about, you can come to this altar this morning and call on the name of Jesus. And you can go home with a freedom and a liberty that you'll never, ever, ever experience outside of salvation. I would try to explain it to you, but it's too good. I don't know how to explain it. You're just going to have to find out for yourself. But there's a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And there's a peace that passeth all understanding. You know what I can do? I can go home at night and lay my head on my pillow and go to sleep and rest just fine. You said, what if this happens? Well, God's still in control. What if this happens? Well, God's still in control. What if something happens and, and you lose your life? Well, thank God I've got a, a greater day ahead of me. There's no way that a child of God can ever lose that we're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us and him that still loves us. We're not on the winning side. We're on the side that has already been declared the victory. And I say, thank God, victory in Jesus. Amen. It's all in Jesus. Everything we read this morning was through him, by him, in him. It all goes back to him. It all comes down to what you do with Jesus Christ, whether you accept, accept him or reject him. By the way, not to receive Jesus is to reject Jesus. If you don't have that assurance in your heart, why not get it this morning? A preacher, I've been a church member my whole life. I've done that. I didn't ask you about that. I asked you, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let's stand together.